Hello, people of the tube. Hi, some book updates or some things. Let's, let's do some things. I'm going to Japan tomorrow. Just a quick weekend trip. It just felt odd if I didn't do these sort of book updates because we, we've got a few and I don't know what happened to April. I told myself I'd slow down, <laughs> but but we're, we're doing way too much, I think. And I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. Dress is high blood pressure is high, but th there are no signs of stopping. <laughs> no signs of stopping. I can't. I can't. Doing the most here. I don't know why, but thank goodness the skin isn't too bad, so we're, we're good. As long as this is okay, we're okay. Saving face. Facades. Ah. Going to Japan tomorrow. Some book updates. I'm leaving right after work. Actually, kind of like cutting it, cutting it close, but we should be fine. I'm Nathan, by the way, if you're new here. I read books because reading is sexy, and if you're not reading, you're not sexy. We had an ARC for Ben Lerner's The Lights. I, I like Ben Lerner. There's a few of his poems. I've only ever read, like, singles, things here and there on, a, like, the Atlantic Quarterly or Poetry.org or whatever it is. And I like his stuff. And this was this was nice to finally have like a collection to read something from, you know, beginning to end a compilation of stuff of his. And this is definitely his pandemic baby. It's very much being on a nitro cold brew within a Philip Glass song or being lost in a Zaha Hadid building. We look a lot at technology and the body and Lerner has this like beautiful ability to jump from one thing to the next from line to line and it's insane the way his mind travels it jumps from one thing to the next way too quickly and you sort of get lost in it but that's the beauty of Lerner's poems is that you're supposed to get lost in this like overwhelming sense that's how he builds his inertia throughout his poems and by the end of every poem, you just feel like wowed, big wowed in like, I'm such a small speck on the planet, in the solar system, in the universe, that kind of thing, yet I'm interconnected to everything. And that's the majority of the poems while also a lot of his reflections on being a father, what it means to raise a child, the responsibilities one has as sort of an adult with child. It's a good you know, solid three stars. I want to say if you like Lerner, uh, I think you'll like this collection. Uh, the Lights by Ben Lerner is out by Ferrer and Strauss, September 5th. Look out for it. The Lights, Ben Lerner. So yes, I wanted to balance out the poetry, way too much poetry. Like, I love poetry, but you can only take so much, especially when you read like a collection. You're just like going, you know, like sifting through poems. It's That's not how you should read poetry. You should read poetry in between things, you know, one every morning, that kind of thing, so that you really settle within the poems. Okay, yeah, balance. So I did The Whole by Hiroko Oyamada because I saw Pato recently read it and the slander, the slander. And I was like, how, how can you? Look at this cover, it's so gorgeous. Yeah. Striking, striking. But it tells the story of Asa and her husband who moved to the countryside of her husband's hometown. And weird shit goes on. Weird shit starts sprucing up. There's holes everywhere. There's this big black monster animal thing. And from then on, it just, yeah, there's this really mysterious, mysterious, funky quality to everything. And it's a tiny book. Thing is though, the whole mystery and oddness of the book, the freaky shit, 
it's just really atmospheric. Nothing ever like climaxes or there's no, everything is just really subtle and it's, it's very quiet. Reminds me a lot, um, not really because it doesn't have that same wham bam effect, but it reminds me a lot of Audition. If anyone's read or seen Audition, the last 15 minutes of Audition by Takashi Miike, I think it is, who's great. If anyone's seen his other show, Hair Extensions, that one's wild. That one's about like hair that attacks people because it's cursed, cursed hair. Audition, the movie, Takashi Miike, the last, everything is really mysterious and freaky and it's very soft and light and very slow and it sort of creeps under your skin and by the last 15 minutes of film it, it, it gets you it's wham bam effect this did not do that this did the whole three-fourths of this is just like weird and then i don't know in the end the payoff just doesn't do it justice especially when you have something this small you know what i mean this is like 92 pages 92 pages i think it is also trying to be a social critique of the role of woman as wife or as mother in contemporary japanese society which is such an interesting thing to look at given that on this channel i seem to read a lot about that with with Miyoka kawakami and with Sayaka Murata, both female Japanese writers who look at the role of woman in society. And and this one wanted to try. This one was like, let me hop into the discussion, guys. Let me contribute to something. And then just doesn't. It just scrapes the surface just as it does with everything else. Freaky shit that goes on just scrapes the surface as well. Just really kind of disappointed by this. Very disappointed. I had some had a nice photo shoot with it in the park though, so that's, I think, it, but very much a letdown. This is why sometimes buying books for the cover, I, I've been got. I've been got. I bought this specifically for the cover and I've been got. So we go back to poetry with, well, I guess it's not really poetry, but poetry prose with Jane, Maggie Nelson. Does this need an introduction? Do we need a blurb about this? I feel like everyone's read this. I read it in a single day and I, I just couldn't put it down. I, like every time I stopped, I wanted to get back into it because Maggie Nelson, big brain energy, just has this beautiful way of asking, pondering all the things we think about when we lose somebody. It's that thing where like death is sort of like this odd nudge and nudges your entire world, shifts things. It's very much like, Anyone ever do that prank where you move things in like your parents' room or your brother or sister's room like an inch to the left so everything like feels odd? It's very much like that, death. And you really re-examine like what life is and the unfulfilled life when you have this missing person in your life. I'm surprised it actually worked for me. What I feel like this is is very much what Truman Capote did with In Cold Blood and sort of crime murder as a genre in non-fiction from a very like fiction background writer. That same effect I feel is what Maggie Nelson was trying to achieve by looking at murder through prose poetry like this, I think was very effective and beautifully done. Beautifully compiled too. How she collected everything and decided to split things up and when to reveal certain information about her Aunt Jane is, is wonderful. Yeah, and now I'm reading Teaching a Stone to Talk by Annie Diller doing a buddy read of this with John. I'll have his Instagram handle below. He's got a bookstagram. And yeah, it's been a long time. I haven't read Dillard in a really long time. And it's so good to be back. So good to be back. It's like going back to the cabins and just, you know, letting loose, having five meals a day, not worrying about anything, basking in the sun, forgetting that technology exists and the real world exists. It's, it's so nice. But you know, Dillard begins the book with death and clowns. Like, what a way to go. What a way to go. Love you, Dillard. Crazy. My first Dillard was Pilgrim at Tinker Creek and absolutely loved it. 
we've got good old Dillard through a couple of essays about nature, eclipses, weasels, and of course the titular essay, teaching a stone to talk. A 30 year old man who is actually trying to teach a rock how to talk. The way that Dillard starts these stories are kind of just like out there, but then she gets you. I don't know how she does it. Her language, her prose, it just settles in within the body so naturally that you're just like, yeah, yeah, Dillard, I get it, I get it. It's really about nothing but nature. And just like the way she compiled these sentences, I thought was well, well done. Pacific waves fall up and slide back. Elysian expands. Night follows day. An albatross dies and dries on a cliff. A cool current upswells from the ocean floor. Fishes multiply. Flies swarm. Stars rise and fall and diving birds dive. The news, in other words, breaks on the beaches. And taking it all in are the trees. The Palo Santo trees crowd the hillsides like any outdoor audience. They face the lagoons, the lava lowlands, and the shores. Oh God, she just knows how to do nature. She's so observant of the world and it's just so beautiful through her lens. Her writing is like going up to the peak of a hike and catching that sunset and just staying there. That's what, that's what her writing is, honestly. This is from Teaching a Stone to Talk, looking at what silence is within nature. There's a vibrancy to the silence, a suppression, as if someone were gagging the world. The silence is not actually suppression. Instead, it is all there is. Talks of God, love her relationship with God and the questions she seeks out in life. I'm about halfway through, but I don't think I'm bringing this to Japan with me. I hope this weekend I am a good vlogger. I, I'm kind of worried because I'm kind of nervous because we, we jam-packed the day and I don't know how we're going to get through everything. <sighs> and through that, I think, I, I, I feel like I'm going to be overwhelmed. Like, I don't know why, but I'm really overwhelmed with just everything. Work, life, even YouTube. I don't know. It, like, I had a really massive editing week. We got, we got a lot done. If anyone wants to know where we're at right now, or I'm in the midst of editing my wa my last week, my last week in LA. Right now it's like on the cutting board, we have 40 minutes. So I'm just like, ooh, I need to chop that down. So I think it's hopefully about 30 minutes or so. I don't know what, let me know what your like median range of like content consumption is. Like, do you like a 30 minute video? Do you like a 45 minute video? Do you like a 20, 18 minute video? And the thing is like, I, I love me an 18 minute video, but when it hits 20, I'm just like, hmm, do I watch this now or do I save it for later? <laughs> Don't ask me why, I'm insane. All right, next time I see you, talk to you, we'll be in Japan. So be well, do good work, keep in touch. <laughs>
the extremes of nature, the, the beauty of it all, the terror of it all, through ideas of God, faith, but also the sufferings of the individual. A lot about quietness, what to do with silence and the immensity of it and really tackling the suppression of it. But silence isn't so much suppressing, she finds through these essays. More so, they're places of solace. And that's hard to see, given that we live in a sort of capitalistic, every man for himself, Darwin-esque world that we live in. But she urges us that there's peace, much peace, angels in silence. And yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Oh, Renee from Sorry Read This Book. It's like, hey, let's do a Cusk. So I'm doing Aftermath with Renee, Rachel Cusk. This is my first nonfiction Cusk. I've only ever read two of the outline books and a second place. So very excited to see what her nonfiction voice and ideas are like. Very, very excited. And also, so minimal. Also, whoever designed these, absolutely gorgeous. I'm gonna eat my sad carrot egg ciabatta bread knockoff. Bye. this orange water. I'm kind of hungry, but I'm telling you, that fake ciabatta bread didn't do it. So I got an, a potato salad sandwich, um, a razor, because I'm dumb and forgot my razor, and these jellies. Although they only had one of these, so. The flight was okay. I was kind of falling asleep, which is bad. Although I'm not even gonna get enough sleep tonight. So, yeah, but what's new? What's new? No sleep. Light orange taste. Not bad, not bad. Look at that, a beautiful, no it's not. It's kind of sad. I just need some kind of zestones, leave me alone. There's nothing at the Lawson, okay? Mm. Love me a carb on carb. I think we're doing an early start, getting coffee. Dire need of coffee. And then just like a lot of thrifting. I think we have like two galleries planned. Tons of shopping. Shop till you drop. Food, of course. And I'm, am I gonna go out? Who knows? Who knows? Gonna say totally honest. I'm feeling a bit more comfortable eating on camera, given that I've been listening to the Melissa Broder eating alone in my car, and just like the nasty shit she's been eating. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I'm gonna do the same, but yeah. Been, been enjoying the podcast a lot. Okay, well, good night. I'm gonna finish this, take a shower, and then knock out because I'm undonezos for today.
Pouty. Tokyo was great. I had a good time. Mostly spent the day shopping, just like going to a bunch of stores that have been on my list for forever. I haven't been back to Japan since 2019, I believe, in summer, which is awful. Never go in the summer. It's it's way too hot and humid. Like, don't don't put yourself through any of that. It's the worst. Sadly, the, the thrift gods were not in our favor. I did not find anything, minus like one thing, but it was brand new. Like, I I'll get to that later, but I was gonna go out, but I think like my body was just like, not a good idea. You've got a flight the next day, not a good idea. Um, my flight the next day was at like 11 a.m. in Narita, which is a bit far. It's a bit far from city center, so you just have to plan accordingly because it takes like almost like an hour and 30 minutes to get to the airport. And then plus like airport time, you want to be there a little early and all of that. Thankfully, I I left. I did Zip Air, which was really nice. They're super fast with like check-in and all. So it was just like really easy. Uh, loved that. First time with Zip Air. Zip Air is really good if anyone wants like budget economy, but it's like decent. It's not like, you know, spirit, <laughs> but it's like the spirit of Japan. Actually, I want to backtrack the spirit of japan would probably be peach airlines that's that's true economy which i flew to get into tokyo and uh anyway peach is peach you you get what you pay for and zip is a little more expensive than peach but it's like it's it's good it's like Alaska. Book updates though. And then I picked up Aftermath, Rachel Cusk. This is interesting. I kind of enjoyed this. I love how Cusk remains Cusk in her nonfiction as she does in her fiction, if that makes sense. Like all the metaphors are there, all the language is there. And for someone who has never read fiction Cusk and picks this up, I think would like feel a bit meh. So I definitely think if you're gonna read Cusk, definitely start with her fiction. I think it works a lot better. Beautiful in the way she explores her own divorce and the word aftermath in itself, the devastation, but also the sort of beautiful harvest and freedom of the self after something like that, especially when you have children. Uh, she looks at the deconstruction of gender normative roles and yeah, just one's purpose in life. And it's beautiful, it's it's done, done well. It's very much like an elevated diary. I think the way that she ended the book, that very particular writer's choice was just perfect, I think, and just sums up who Cusk is as a writer. My only complaint with this is page 22. And I'm surprised nobody else has talked about this because I was like sifting through Goodreads reviews, like trying to figure out if anyone else has picked up on this. Nobody, nobody. But let me read this for you because I'm kind of flabbergasted. We were a man and a woman who in our struggle for equality had simply changed clothes. We were two transvestites, a transvestite couple. Well, why not? Except that I did both things, was both man and woman, while my husband, meaning well, only did one. Like, I get it. I get what Cusk was trying to do in this moment in talking about the roles of man and woman, husband and wife, mother and father. But did she really have to use transvestites? It just... Okay, well, for time's sake, let's see when this was published. 2012. Yeah, no, not gonna cut it. I'm sorry. But like, yeah, this could have easily been edited out. This, and it, it also appears in like different parts too, but like, yeah, it was very odd. Very, very odd. Like what an odd, like that was a choice that you made and that could have easily been avoided. Whoever the fucking editor of this was, I swear to God. But I, I'm gonna write an email. I think I'm gonna write an email if I have the time. I'm gonna write an email because this is, uh, but also if they ever do a reprint of these, like these are the, per they can't. This is like the perfect cover. Like if a new edition appears, it, it has to stay like this. That was the only odd thing, but everything else was fine. I really need to finish the outline series. I, I wanna read the last book. I think Ben recently finished this trilogy. 
and I was just like, I, I need to, I need to get on that. Yeah. After finishing this, I decided I have a long list of heresies that I need to get through. So I just got I Am Homeless If This Is Not My Home by Lori Moore. It is out by Knopf in June. Yeah, it's Lori Moore's first novel in a really long time. At first, like when I was reading it, I was like, damn, this is a really long short story. <laughs> and I should have been a lot smarter, but the, on the cover, it literally says novel. So I'm just like, God damn it. I promise I read, I really do. But to be honest, it's really hard to sum up what this is about, but it examines death and questions of death. And in some ways it's like a ghost story. And I'm just gonna leave it at that because I'm, I'm really not sure where my thoughts are right now. And I'm only about like 22% of the way through, but I'm, I'm sort of enjoying it. There's a lot of humor as well as existential questions about death and the meaning of death, how death lends a hand into the living and just really peculiar novel. That's as far as updates go in terms of reading. Hi, Nathan from the editing room. <laughs> I didn't do a proper sign off. So here to tell you to um, be well, do good work and keep in touch.